The myth of the lost cause of the Confederacy after the Civil War. Up until the time of the Vietnam War, it was the boast of Americans, particularly military-minded Americans, that the United States has never lost a war. Well, that was not true. Part of the United States, namely 11 states that formed the Confederacy, did lose a war, and they lost a very, very bitter post-war time as well. They lost economically, physically, and even spiritually. In the North, of course, it was different. In May of 1865, the returning Union veterans, ever after known as the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, had a wonderful, triumphant return. The boys in blue had come home. For two days, they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, 150,000 returning Union veterans, the GAR. Thousands of people lined the streets to see them, maybe catch a glimpse of the boy who had marched away so many months ago. The bands played appropriate patriotic airs, like The Girl I Left Behind Me and John Brown's Body and When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. It was a triumphant parade. But for the defeated veterans of Robert E. Lee's Army in Northern Virginia, there were no parades and no music played and no one cheered. Because of General Sherman's extensive destruction of the railroads in the South, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, after their defeat at Appomattox, had to walk home. Some officers may have had horses, but mostly the horses did not survive the walk home because the men had to eat. So they slaughtered the horses halfway home. When they got home, they found that their homes often had been burned. In some case, entire towns had been burned. After Sherman's march, from Atlanta to the sea, his march through Georgia and the Carolinas, he had cut a swath 60 miles wide, which was so destructive that there is nothing left upon it, that land, to support a family. Um, houses had been looted, and those animals not taken or stolen by the Union troops were had been slaughtered. Under Sherman's scorched earth policy, any item that could be useful for farming or manufacturing was destroyed. Now on top of this, consider that one third of the young men between 18 and 35 in the South was dead and a half as many as half the number had lost an arm or a leg. It was a very, very difficult time. There was no cash because Confederate money had been declared worthless. I recall half a century ago sitting in a small general store in Warrenton, Virginia, where a group of older men talked about the time after the war. All of them were sons of Confederate veterans. I recall one remark specifically that a man made to me. I had asked him a question. His father had fought in the Stonewall Brigade. He turned to me about the time after the war and he said, son, you got to remember now, there weren't no Marshall Plan in them days. What, what an understatement. In fact, in the deep southern cotton states, the economies did not regain their pre-Civil War economies until the 1940s when we started picking up for World War II. There was no work, there was no market for cotton, there was no cash. The biggest industry in the state of Mississippi in 1866, the year after the war, was the manufacture of artificial limbs. To compound all this, there was the Reconstruction Act that amounted to a period of 12 years of army occupation, as we are doing now in Iraq. The South was under martial law for 12 years. There's one historian who believes that the beginnings of Dixieland music stem from the pawn shops of New Orleans. After the war, the Confederate veterans who were musicians, bugle blowers, realized that they had no future in blowing taps or reveille, so they turned in, they pawned their musical instruments. The freed slaves, almost all of whom were familiar with the so-called Negro spirituals, uh, when the saints go marching in and swing low sweet chariot, purchased these trumpets and practiced with one another and found they could turn out some very unusual music. Southern leaders, prominent educated men, professed a firm belief during the war that they were fighting for a righteous cause with a full blessing and encouragement of Almighty God. 
at the end of the war, they had a dilemma. Remember, these people were very religious people. If someone ever asks you, what was the biggest Protestant army that ever existed on the face of the earth, your first thought will be, of course, Cromwell's uh, Puritan army, the Roundheads, who defeated and uh, captured and eventually killed King George, King Charles I. Cromwell's Puritans. That's a good answer, but that's wrong. The biggest Protestant army that ever lived was the Confederate Army. The Confederate Army was 98% Protestant. They were mostly Scots-Irish, mostly Presbyterians, but up in the Tidewater area, they're probably more Episcopalians. But they professed a belief during the war that they had the full encouragement of God. At the end of the war, they had a dilemma. They could not admit that God was inside of the Yankees. No, that's, that's crazy. Uh, so they devised a new answer. The name, The Lost Cause, was created by a Richmond newspaper writer named Edward Poller. Uh, among the many tenets of The Lost Cause are A, that Robert E. Lee was godlike, and B, that really slavery didn't have much to do with it, it was fought for more for Southern independence or uh, states' rights or whatever. Uh, but nevertheless, the Confederate Army was very noble, but it simply was too small. It ran out of men, out of materials, out of railroads. Um, in the literary form of the lost cause, as in the Greek tragedy, there must be a great hero, a great heroic character who rises above the failure. For Southerners, Robert E. Lee, or actually a rather idealized um, caricature of Robert E. Lee, became the embodiment of that image. Lee, the marble man, he used to be called because there's so many marble statues and busts of Lee throughout Richmond, uh, is in the Lost Cause mythology, he believed to be the ultimate man of virtue. One writer described Lee as, quote, bathed in the white light which falls directly upon him from the smiling, approving God. Come on. <laughs> One of his subordinate general, John Daniel, wrote, quote, a divinity in his bosom shone translucent through the man, and his spirit rose up godlike. Ooh, well, if, you would, if Robert E. Lee had been alive to hear those words, he would have been embarrassed, and then he would have laughed because he was a, a very sensible, very noble man, but he certainly wouldn't have uh, put up with that. Also, reasonable people in the South, they might have noted that the, at Gettysburg, the man they sought to elevate to sainthood had failed as a commander, particularly at Pickett's Charge, leading his army to its most devastating defeat. But Lee, the great hero, could not have lost Gettysburg unless some human error led to the failure of the Confederate Army. Therefore, Lee was a hero, there must be a villain. Well, it's easy to find the villain. First of all, he has to be not a Virginian. General Longstreet of Georgia actually practically volunteered for the job. He put a, a target on his chest. He said, yeah, I'll be the villain, first of all. Uh, after the war, Longstreet had an unfortunate knack for including Robert E. Lee among those who should bear the responsibility for wartime failures, particularly at Gettysburg. Modern historians would probably tend to agree with that assessment. Longstreet did more than that, however, to, alleviate, to alienate his countrymen. He committed the dual sins of becoming A, a Republican, and B, a Roman Catholic after the war. Well, people in Richmond would probably